Hi, everyone. Welcome to the last of a series of webcasts from the World Agility Forum. Before the conference starts this Saturday, the 26th by 3 p.m. London time zone. The World Agility Forum mission is clear, highlighting individuals and organizations for their effort and commitment to initiatives in achieving agility. This year, we will host Steve Denning and Daryl Rigby as the keynote speakers. We also have five other panels from Future of Software Development, Future of Management, Future of Organizations, Agile, Where to, to From Here, and the Future of Work. If you don't have your seat yet, please grab yours at experienceagile.org. Before we start, I would like to thank you all the support of our amazing co-organizers, Agile Alliance. Without them, it was all not also possible to be here. So, but more than that, we also have sponsors like Mercedes-Benz IO, Scrum Alliance, Everys, Scale Agile, CINT, IC Agile, MSG Live, uh, The Flow. All these organizations are helping for us to be here today and next weekend. And our main partners, Business Agility Institute, Lega Master, and Central Med. Today, we have a world-class panel led by Nigel Thurlow, a friend that was introduced several years ago by uh, Brian Rivera, which was introduced some years ago uh, by Thomas Friend, which was introduced some years ago by Peter Stevens. So in our conferences, usually that's what happens, network uh, and a lot of friends. So today I introduce you and I pass the ball to Nigel Thurlow. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. Good morning to everybody. And uh, thank you to you and your team for enabling this panel, but also Experience Agile to continue this year in these strange times. This is unusual for me because I'm usually speaking on these panels as a panelist. So I'm going to have to learn to keep quiet and say nothing for the next hour, which is going to be incredibly difficult. But I'm truly excited to have assembled the panel you see before you. This is truly an exceptional panel of what I consider world experts. I'm going to let them introduce themselves to you in a moment. And it's a truly international panel. We've got Steve over in Malta. I'm sitting in Dallas, Texas. Jabe's on the east coast of the USA. We've got Dirk in Belgium. Andrew Blessim, who's up at the wee hours in Australia. And Sonia down in South Africa. So a truly exceptional panel. Uh, I'm just going to ask them all to introduce themselves. And I'm going to, Sonia, let's start with you. And then you can pass the ball from there. Just tell everybody a little bit about yourself. With the mute button. Unmute myself. Thanks, Nigel. Um, Sonia Bluchnote. Um, I wear two hats. I look after the um, the commercial part of the business of Cognitive Edge, um, company founded by Dave Snowden, and then I also run um, a company called More Beyond in South Africa. And I think in this particular conversation, I wear the complexity hat. So that's what I've been doing for the last two decades: is the practical application of complexity. So that's me. I'm going to pass to Andrew. Let's keep it in the Southern Hemisphere. Hi, all. Uh, Andrew Blaine. And yes, it is quite late here. So I'm hoping my brain's going to work reasonably well. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Elaborate, which is a lean agile consultancy in Australia. And more recently, the founder of a uh, remote working effectiveness framework called Remote AF. Um, I'm going to pass to Dirk because he's right in the middle. Well, thank you. Uh, Andrew, I'm uh, Dirk. I live in Belgium since '93. I'm helping uh, companies uh, globally actually to work smarter instead of harder um, in the area of lean and operational excellence with a lot of teaching, coaching, uh, mentoring uh, approach. Uh, I also combined this for about 12 years with an academic uh, position at Ghent University as a professor of industrial engineering, teaching and doing research in the same domain. I'll pass it on to Steve. Yes, um, hello everyone. And first of all, thank you, Nigel, for, uh, for inviting me to this uh, event. Really excited to participate. I am the managing director of Tameflow Consulting, uh, which uh, promotes the use of this method that I created called Tameflow, also known as Tame the Flow or Tame Your Flow. What I do, well, I create pragmatic, human-centered, inclusive, sustainable, systemic, breakthrough performance innovation in knowledge-intensive digital businesses. Well, that was a mouthpiece, and I just pass over to Jabe. Hi, uh, I'm Jay Bloom. I'm uh, currently uh, a member of uh, Red Hat's Global Transformation Office. Um, 
when I'm not trying to work with, uh, or when I'm not working with large global international companies uh, doing transformation work, I am getting my PhD at Carnegie Mellon where I study something called transition design, um, which uh, is uh, focused on trying to figure out how to uh, transition societies to more sustainable uh, resource consumption over the two to 300 year time frame. So, thanks. Wow, uh, as I said, a truly exceptional panel. So I'm gonna start this off this morning, uh, well, this morning in Texas and goodness knows what time around the world, um, with a simple question to you all. Um, we wanna talk a little bit about lean and agile strategies and, and where we may have gone wrong. So where have we gone wrong with our strategies and approaches, especially with things like lean thinking? In the current pandemic crisis, we've seen a lot of impacts in the way we used to do business and the way we used to behave. So what do you think we've learned and what do you think we'll need to change? And where do you think we may have gone wrong? Um, I'm going to throw the ball out to whoever wants to pick that up and run with that. Or I'm going to pick Me. Dirk. <laughs> okay, nice. So I think uh, actually... Uh... There's quite a lot of stuff uh, that is in some companies going wrong with lean, but this already started before the pandemic. But actually we saw some of the effects during the pandemic. First of all, I think uh, there is still a lack of deeper understanding by leadership that lean is not a goal, but a strategy. And that the goal is not cutting costs, but actually developing people and organizing whatever you do in a smarter way so that as a consequence, you become more profitable by delivering more value to the customer. And in that regard, uh, since the focus has so much been on cost and the way how many companies are structured, let's say in a silo fashion, there is a huge uh, tendency to eliminate the waste on a, what I call a square meter. And we get like very uh, sub-optimized, very efficient square meters. But if we all connect them together in this concept called value stream, well, then uh, we have a set of disconnected uh, sub-optimized square meters with value streams that are really not flowing very well. Although the concept of flow, if you look at the seminal book by uh, Womack and Jones, Lean Thinking, which was published in 96, actually there the concept of value streams was already introduced. So it's not that let's say that knowledge uh, should be unknown to many people. And we've seen it also now in the, in the pandemic, uh, especially in, in supply chains, where you see because of purchasing efficiency, for example, we moved manufacturing to many other places on the planet. We, we created very cheap uh, conversion cost uh, square meters, but then if you link everything together uh, because of distances, because of sub-optimization also in transport, actually lead times really uh, went up. So uh, if you then combine this with some bull whip effects that we saw, uh, then, you, then you, can, you can imagine that quite some companies actually, and also customers, were experiencing uh, a lack of supply of their products and services. So it's funny, uh, Dirk, when you mention about transportation and the real cost going up, because Jabe, you were just talking about sustainability. So I'm going to toss this to you because that's an interesting segue into some of the comments that Dirk was making about our lean world. Yeah, I mean, so the first, the first thing that I would say kind of as a reaction to the first question, roughly agreeing with what Dirk said is that I think what one of the things that's been lost to uh, kind of modern uh, lean implementations is the concept of 4VL, uh, in particular, the 4V part of it. Uh, so, you know, 4V is just uh, velocity, um, uh, variation, variety, and uh, my last one's going to come, visibility, right? So w w what tends to happen, I think, in most lean implementations is the velocity, which is basically just flow-ish. It's not really the velocity from Scrum, uh, but the flow rate through the system and visibility, those two tend to link up really easily with, with a reduction in variation. I'm uh, sorry, variety, right? Um, and the, the uh, variation. So the, the point being here, uh, you get these, this weird tension that's missing in most of these implementations, which is, um, you know, the original Toyota production system 
was designed to reduce variability of output in order to increase variety of response, right? So basically by reducing variation, you increase the variability of things that you can respond to in the market, right? And that lesson has been lost and the result is you get a balance, an over focus on as Dirk pointed out, efficiency. And that, that focus on that variability reduction limits the ability for the system to create variable response to novel input. So you get a big novel input like something like coronavirus and you get you have brittle systems, right? So all of this leads into kind of the sustainability conversations around things like uh, designing a system to be more resilient as opposed to more efficient, which has to do with balancing all of these factors as opposed to overemphasis on one or the other, right? Um, and you know sustainability in these in these modern uh, or the, in this current ecosystem, what's happening right now, has to do with you know taking a theory of constraints view of this. We optimized for certain bottlenecks in the system, and those bottlenecks were based on the goal that we had and we wanted to achieve. And that goal was based in a marketplace. When the marketplace changes, automatically the uh, the bottlenecks will move. They'll move around in the system. And so in order to be resilient, we have to be capable of not just optimizing the current value stream, but imagining and quickly reorienting to new value streams that flow through new bottlenecks. And that has to do with knowledge transfer and skills transfer and inter-team communication and a lot of things that don't happen inside of individual teams, but happen across an organization. And I think that's what we're gonna learn from this particular lesson. Well, that's that's quite a stunning uh, summary. I mean, the over-reliance on, uh, on efficiency, I think it was Drucker that said something like, there is nothing so useless as doing efficient that which should not be done at all. Steve, you are known as a guy who knows a little bit about the theory of constraints and flow. Is there any comments you can add to pivot off what Jabe has said? Yeah, well, uh, thank you, Jabe, for uh, for uh, for that pass because uh, you just mentioned TOC, which uh, which is one of my pet peeves. Um, let's see if I can make a connection here with uh, with Lean. I think one uh, one of the key components of uh, of Lean is uh, is also um, respect for people, and I think that has gone lost in uh, in these last years where we've had the uh, the agile wars of sorts, especially in, in knowledge work and software engineering, uh, which all originate from from what? The software manifesto, the Agile uh, manifesto. Now, if you think about that manifesto, it's, uh, it's structured with a left side and a right side, and uh, we value something on one side more than on the other side. So that, that in and itself is creating like a uh, a divide, which uh, then in some circles became also very, uh, like, uh, you know, colorfully expressed with, with the chicken and pigs metaphor, which I hate. And then eventually, you know, that was no longer politically correct and, uh, and was removed. But still, you have this, this notion of us versus them. And uh, uh, especially there is this divide between, uh, between the folks on the ground and, uh, uh, and, uh, and management. Now, combine that with... Uh, with cost accounting, which uh, which uh, um, uh, like Dirk uh, uh, sort of mentioned, and uh, and uh, the chasing of uh, of uh, efficiency, well, you you will end up uh, improving efficiency to the point that you yourself, on the basis of of um, cost parameters, uh, you will be made redundant because everything else is so efficient. So it becomes like counterproductive, and in this. In this, we lose again the respect for people. So let's connect this to TOC. You all know the story of Herbie. I will not repeat that I'm, I'm known as, as a broken record when it comes to the story of Herbie. But you know the point where, where the whole uh, troop of scouts slows down and they do some things. But now I summarize that. Yes, it is subordinated to the constraint. It is elevating. But above all, it is we leave no one behind alone in the woods. And a company that is being challenged, like in these times with the problems of uh, you know, COVID and what else, uh, what do they do? Well, they fire people. They are leaving people alone in the woods. That's not the response that I would see 
from a company that understands these mechanisms. And there was there was a, a great speech by Goldratt, uh, lecture on on TOC, um, which referred to the crisis of 2008. And you should look it up because it's really illuminating, uh, where he explains how these companies react in panic, um, without considering that in reality, the uh, you know, greater mechanism of the world will still produce the uh, demand of stuff. So if you are firing people because your supply chain for the for a moment has a whipple effect, well, you're creating a problem for yourself later. So there are many, of course, systemic elements, but I would summarize with leave no man behind. You know, Steve, it's funny you mentioned that because uh, from my days in Toyota, uh, they learned during the big oil crises when uh, companies were suddenly strapped for cash for about a year, they offloaded a bunch of people. And then suddenly the crisis was over and you can't just onboard a bunch of people back into something like Toyota because learning the Toyota way is years of practice and years of being part of that indoctrination into that culture and the way of working. Um, so it's actually very pertinent. Andrew, Sonia, do you, how do you want to pick up the ball from Steve? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Um, and I thought that all three responses before me were amazing. Uh, Look, I, I probably want to focus in a little bit on some of the great things about the last decade uh, in particular. I think ag ag lean and agile thinking has driven some amazing change in workplaces. Um, I, I think you find in organisations that have embraced agility that you've got happier teams that are more effective. Um, you would have seen a real ease of transition into remote working during the pandemic. Uh, and most of the teams that have measurements in them are seeing productivity gains, um, the, the, at least the ones we speak to. Uh, and those organisations have also got real responsiveness compared to where they would have been with long planning cycles and, uh, and that kind of in the past. Um, if I'm thinking about what the, what the biggest uh, problem I've seen over, over that time is, um, it's probably these large scale transformations um, which can sometimes feel a little bit like uh, uh, human experimentation with outer control group um, and, and led by people that are potentially early on the Dreyfus curve with some of these, uh, some of these frameworks and, and some of the deeper thinking in the space. Um, and that sort of, yeah, as, as Steve said, are we, are we, do we really embrace that humane principle when we do things like that? Are, are, we, are we really leaving no, no man behind? Or woman. Or woman. What an awesome segue, Sonia. <laughs> yeah, please don't leave me behind. Um, yeah, I think Nigel... I want to link a little bit with um, with what Jabe said, you know, and I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not really an expert in lean, so I must just put that out there. But I think what I'm what I'm seeing is is definitely this over focus on on efficiency and how that has stripped away the resilience in in organizations and our adaptive capacity. And I find it really, um, you know, in, interesting as well um, when, you know, when you think about also the it, it seems like speed, you know, so Jabe, you mentioned velocity. And I think, especially from an agile perspective, it's almost like speed has become the holy grail. And I think sometimes, you know, last, last year, I had the opportunity to spend some time with Alicia Juarero. And she um, reminded me again of, of the, this idea of different kinds of time. So we have Kronos time, the chronological time that we're all kind of aware of that we're in. And then there's this interesting idea of Kairos time where context and time come together. It's kind of the opportune time. And I think we kind of almost fall into this idea. It's like the Red Queen syndrome. We just want to go faster and faster and faster. We're speeding up in Kronos time. And I think that sometimes causes us to miss some of these Kairos moments when there's an opportunity or a risk or something that we need to be responding to. And so I think there's, there's almost like this, you know, there's an, we're, we're stripping out all of the slack in our system. So we're saying to people, you know, we, we essentially, we want learning organizations and we want adaptive capacity and people need to learn, but we don't give them any time to do that. Um, we just keep wanting to go faster. We just, we never take a step back to reflect on, 
what's happening in the context and are we still heading in the in the right direction and so i think there, there's a we, we need to um from a complexity perspective as well i think we we cannot just engineer away all of these tensions we actually need to engage with some of them and sometimes do some very counterintuitive things um so i think that's my mm. two cents no i think that's awesome so that sort of brings me on to one of the things i was thinking about this there's a, there's a lot of tools and frameworks and approaches methodologies and other things out there in the world and we all variously represent different aspects of of knowledge so what new tools should people be learning to augment those provided by the lean and agile worlds do we really want more frameworks or do we need just better understanding and application of the various tools and approaches already available to us who'd like to take that i'll, I'll jump first this time nigel i think I, I won't go as far as saying that we don't need new tools but i think what we almost need more of is is you know I, i'm not sure what to call them but it's almost like meta skills you know it's it's um things like um you know rather than having new tools for change management for example which i think is an oxymoron anyway we need to create change resilience in 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 the in our people um you know focusing on things like the ability to be in uncertainty to um to not want certainty all the time to things like sense making critical thinking fostering curiosity you know i think those things are are almost becoming more important than tools that that would be my take on it mm i can see andrew twitching mm -hmm. yeah look i actually think there's there's some really interesting stuff happening out there and it all seems to be it, it, to me it feels like we've we've had the initial agile movement um and there's a whole bunch of things that are emerging at the moment that seem post agile with a lot of alignment in the way that they're structured up and the, and the thinking behind them um and i'm thinking about agenda shift which i think is awesome um team topologies uh time flow flow system there, there seems to be a whole bunch of things that are coming together around this idea and i think that it really they're, they're frameworks that are underpinned by complexity science so they're they're, they're recognizing the uh the organic nature of the systems that they're interacting with rather than treating systems as uh, i suppose silicon based things that you can put uh, put rules and policies in and and change um, and I'm, I'm actually pretty excited to see what the next decade or two is going to look like uh, I think there's some fascinating stuff coming out that's uh, that, that's truly novel and interesting mm. well I, I have I have I have two things that I think uh, you know people should be thinking about or learning about more uh, the, fir the first is just this idea that instead of kind of thinking of a hierarchy as a power structure, uh, reimagining a hierarchy as different time frames. So uh, in most organizations, I would divide most organizations to three different time frames, a short tactical time frame, uh, a strategic time frame, and a systems thinking time frame. Um, and that would go from in most organizations, two weeks, six to 18 months, uh, 18 months to three years. Um, and the idea of this is to say that when we, when we look at what's happening, the way that I would describe kind of what, what Sonia was talking about is not just speed, but also something called temporal compression. And temporal compression works by saying basically, if all our decisions are basically satisficing decisions, in other words, we can't do a complete analysis of the system, we have to make the best guess we can in the limited time we have, and there is any advantage to being the first mover in a game, then you'll get temporal compression because basically what happens is people will take the the advantage the temporary advantage of moving faster and it will cause everyone else to have to move faster as well it causes a massive amount of compression and obviously like the most extreme example of this is like micro trading on, on the stock market where people are doing like you know nanosecond trades 
Um, and, and people are competing for uh, real estate in lower Manhattan to get closer and closer. Their light speed of their internet connections starts mattering in these strategic plays, right? So if you, the result of this temporal compression is that it tends to squeeze the top layers down. And the result of this is kind of like a version of micromanagement where uh, the upper managers are trying to, um, the, 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 the managers who are supposed to be responsible for longer time frames, which all I mean by that is like, what what are you doing right now? The answer to that is your temporal is your time frame, and however long the story that you're telling tells you about how long you are thinking about. And if everybody's trying to tell a two week story, then the people who are actually doing the work don't get to tell their own stories. They they have somebody else telling their story for them, and they're like, "That's not really what's happening." It's it all very confusing, and people get angry, and there's this. So, this plays out, I think, in industry in a very specific way. Um, development and operations are, are both these lower time scale experiences, and you know we can see the agile movement as almost purely focused on ch on fixing or changing development. Uh, almost explicitly by removing designers, architects, management, right? They, they want to be able to focus on their time frame, even though they wouldn't say that. Th this works well to the point where you break operations. Then we have the rise 10 years ago of the DevOps movement to uh, an attempt to balance both of these forces in the organization. One force uh, focused on change, one focus, focused on stability, yeah? But these are both at the tactical layer. Now, in the organizations that I work with that are the most successful, what they're realizing is that the velocity uh, of change uh, is being um, significantly constrained by their architectural decisions. So all of a sudden, we're getting this next tier come in, which is a real focus on how do we reintegrate architecture? How do we reintegrate product management? Which, by the way, I think is broken in almost every single business I've ever been in. And then finally, finally, if if we can actually open up that mid tier and start having these conversations about product management and architecture again, maybe then when leaders come down with strategies that make perfect sense to leadership, they'll actually start making sense to the, the people doing the work on the ground. So that's, that's, that's one frame uh, that I think uh, is really important for people to understand. And then the second one, just because I've been ranting a little bit, I'll do shortly, which is we got to move, we got to, we, we have people moving from project to product, right? This idea of like temporary funding to long-term long-standing funding because we have a thing that doesn't go away when the project ends. Then we have a movement from product to service, which is the realization that when you, when you actually put this product in production, there are requirements for that. And then finally, we've got this realization that all of the frameworks that we've built around services like ITIL and all these other ideas are, are techni technical social systems. In other words, they focus on the technology before thinking about the social system. We need to invert that back and that, so that that's a move from service to platform. So the, the two big things I think are this five elements across these three time, three time spaces and then also platform thinking. If people can understand those things, I think they'll understand at least in enterprise what most enterprises are currently challenged with. Actually, there's a, there's a couple of comments coming in from people who are listening in. Um, they're coming, not everybody can see them, but uh, I'll just make a note that uh, there was some conversation from somebody called Andrew Webster says, hence the creation of organizations like Long Now. Uh, to counter temporal compression side effects of negative external, externalities, poor consequences ignored by those who cause them. Um, Bill Kleinbeck is also talking a little bit about operational aspects and talking about the, the new things for the post-agile world. So, uh, Steve, Dirk, I don't know if you want to add in some comments about what you think some of the new focus, new tools or new ideas uh, that we should be uh, taking forward to help us move forward from where we've got to. Uh, yeah, oh, okay, go Derek, go. No, go ahead, go. You go. <laughs> All right. Sorry. So, uh, reflecting on, on this uh, temporal compression uh, dimension and uh, uh, the uh, also the need to uh, to slow down, 
uh, obviously they uh, they uh, they are quite in a, in a conflict there. I, I see clearly an evaporating cloud coming out from this uh, from this uh, discussion. Um, but it's clear that the the pace of uh, of change uh, uh, and the uh, speed of uh, innovation uh, and stuff that happens out there is just increasing and increasing. So we are having uh, a mismatch between the um, the cadences, the rhythms um, of uh, of typical management and what really is needed. Uh, consequentially, um, the way decision making uh, is um, is executed um, must be considered and addressed differently. We must come to a situation where companies. Um, allow for decentralized decision making and not so much for like the agile value of autonomy so you find motivation and uh, and that stuff but simply because without decentralized decision making you would not have the speed to react uh, to what is happening uh, out there however this has another connection to the human dimension because if it's decentralized decision making and yet because of the uh, requirements of law, we have the CEO who's the ultimate responsible for a company. Well, this poor CEO must trust that people in the organization make the right decision. This is one of the most um, challenging um, elements that come out of the evolution of, uh, uh, of markets and, uh, and environments. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's a different thing than, uh, than the, the uh, uh, almost, almost stereotypical uh, thinking that oh well, we must overcome like uh, Taylorism and uh, and hierarchies and so on and so forth. Uh, I think it's it's more uh, it's more vital. It's more a necessity of survival of modern organizations to organize themselves in manner to enable decentralized decision making. But that requires uh, trust. Now another thing that here may be. Uh, connects to uh, to the uh, complexity thinking. By the way, I am I am not versed in complexity thinking, but I do observe. If we take Kinefin and maybe Sonia will correct me, uh, that in uh, all those four quadrants there is this notion of sense and uh, um, and respond, no matter which quadrant you are in, and that means that the sensing ability of the organization uh, needs to uh, to evolve. So the periphery. Uh, needs to be able to capture what is going on in their little context and be able to communicate this to whomever is uh, if, like concerned by by those uh, events and happening. So this means that the feedback loops inside the organization need to be uh, tightened. And because the load of information is always increasing, we must find ways to lower the amount of information that goes around. So the information that goes around needs to be uh, more uh, focused and aiming at what uh, what really uh, really matters. In other words, we need to consider organizations as something that is organic, that has collective intelligence, that has this sense uh, and respond capability built in uh, by like developing a new uh, uh, nervous system within the organization. But I see that everything comes back to this fundamental. It's a matter of trust. Well, I think there's some things for, for Sonia to add, but Dirk, let's, let's hear from you on that particular point because you've got things um, to add. I believe when you ask about uh, new tools or what we need in the future, first of all, I would think like uh, maybe we should also pay more focus to already existing tools and apply them in a more effective way because especially when it comes to lean and, and more in, in the lean uh, uh, world than in the agile world, but I see too many people just implementing the tool where the goal is the tool without understanding the principles behind the tool. So I think we need to go back three steps back and teach people deeper understanding of the principle in order to have a more effective uh, implementation of the tool. And then you also will understand that although the principle might be kind of universal, the tools can well be contextual. We cannot just cut, copy, paste everything from one situation to the other. So there might be some thinking and some, some adaptation there in, in, in the tools, depending on uh, everything that happens both inside the organization, but also what happens outside in the world and, and, and with the customer. 
so that's the first uh, uh, thing. Secondly, I also think that um, when you say new tools, the question is what is new? Because there's a lot of stuff and a lot of knowledge out there for already many years, which has never been brought in the picture or never been linked to some of these principles. If you now see, I think one of the uh, big challenges in Lean where there was too much focus on tools of efficiency, also let's say the hard stuff of the, the hard part of the strategy, there should be way more focus on the soft stuff, which is the culture, the empowerment of the people, the leadership styles. But if you think about leadership by intent, if you think about psychological safety, this is not something new from last year. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of research, a lot of knowledge already out there. The question is, how do we bring this in? And I think uh, in that regard, what happens uh, with the flow system, Nigel, I think it's a really uh, uh, valuable uh, next step to bring in these type of uh, knowledge as well uh, to create uh, different types of leadership where you have empowerment of people. And then to make the link to what uh, Sonia and Jake said, if you look at time, of course, if, if the focus should be on developing people, yeah, there is time needed to do this. If you focus only on the efficient execution of tasks and there's no room to uh, actually develop uh, or no room to fail, yeah, then actually there's not going to be too much uh, learning. You know, it's actually a lot of everything you're saying is valuable. I'm reading some of the comments that are coming in as well. And uh, uh, just to, go, to scroll back on a couple of these that um, uh, Bill, Bill and Andrew are very active in the comments, which is really good. And Bill Kleinbeck is saying things, you know, he's meaning like a shift to being value driven, not stories with whether bulk sprints or continuous delivery. So away from sort of speed, efficiency and more towards value. And we will swing the conversation to value in a few moments. Uh, and of course, Andrew is adding in much more about the criticisms of the agile industrial industrial complex the commercial certification of frameworks, usually without teaching of first principles, which is back to your point, Dirk, uh, that would allow practitioners to operate with situational awareness, something that's well, in, well mentioned in the flow system, of course, in their own context. Uh, and there's some other comments that go on to talk about uh, the dangers of AI and the automation of the customer. And if anybody's watched The Social Dilemma on Netflix, which was released a couple of weeks ago, where it talks about we are not the customer, we have become the product they're selling us as a product as opposed to treating us as a customer. But just back to those first principles, I want to talk a little bit about the whole certification thing because it's coming up in the comments a little bit about what uh, you were saying, Dirk. And despite the fact I'm a PST and I was once a sort of a CST as well, so I did it from both sides of the, the, the sort of scrum guide. And I have close relationships with three of the main certification bodies. I have really good friends in the senior leadership of these, these bodies. But I wonder if we've created a monster. Uh, in my keynote I'm going to be giving over the weekend, I, I sort of recalled that there is currently 270 current agile certifications in the marketplace. It was mind boggling when I looked up that statistic. I got a spreadsheet with them all in there. So questions for the panel is, do you think the obsession around certifications has damaged agile and the whole concept of agility? And if so, what do you think we should be doing about that? Jabe, you're smiling ear to ear. I don't know if we should start with you. <laughs> I, I was laughing at the uh, certification uh, proliferation. Uh, you know, m money makes people do all sorts of interesting things. Um, I, it, listen, I think the basic way I would say this is this, um, it, and it, it, it's like from a resilience uh, viewpoint again. Um, highly effective teams use mental models to notice when. Uh, the mental, mo the predictions the mental model makes. So like, I, I, I imagine that this is about to happen if I do that. Uh, and they use those mental models to notice the mismatch between their predictions and what actually happens, right? And, the, and when they do that, they're doing it because they basically are saying, when there's a mismatch, I need to kind of heighten my cognitive uh, engagement in what's happening because my normal way of working isn't kind of working right now. Something, something's wrong. Uh, something in the environment has changed. Um, and low performance teams uh, use mental models to just stop thinking. They just use them to like think for them. And, and there's this idea in design 
uh, the, uh, uh, there's two different stances of, uh, in, uh, in design. It's actually from a guy named uh, Dennett, who's a philosopher. And he basically says there's this, uh, a design stance and then there's an intentional stance. And a design stance says, I'm looking at a thing like this coffee mug and I'm saying, okay, somebody designed that, like somebody made that. So there's a right way to use this object. I might not know what it is, but there's a correct way to use this. Somebody intended it to be used in a particular way. Now, on the other hand, if I go and I use a, like a software program to play chess, the mental model that I have of the chess game is that there's a player in the computer that intends to win the game. And so I don't think that there's a right way to use the chess game. I think I'm interacting with the chess game in some sort of iterative engagement. In So I think to the extent that licensure, uh, licensure or certification uh, is creating that design stance or that uh, lowering cognitive load stance, that, that this has been thought of before or that I've been certified as a scrum master in three days and therefore I actually know the answer to anything having to do with agile as opposed to I've been doing this for five years or six years and now I might know something. To the extent that it is allowing people to think that they don't have to be engaged consistently in learning and, in, and engaged in understanding the, the system that they're part of, that then it's problematic. To the extent that, you know, it gives people vocabulary and a shared space to work within and the shared way of like exchanging information to each other, eh, it's probably useful. Um, I don't know that, um, I, I, ha I have a CSP, I have a uh, CST, I, I've got all sorts of weird stuff. Uh, I don't use them though. So anyway, that's my, that's what I would say. One of those LinkedIn profiles with acronym soup all the way along, please folks don't do that. It's not cool. Just don't do it. Um, who else would like to jump into this foray? I can say something, Nigel. Of course, I'm not, I don't have any certification myself. I have definitely not agile certifications and I'm not even familiar with all the meanings of all these three or four letter acronyms. But I do see a little bit the uh, history that repeats itself because certifications have been around for much longer than agile. Actually, I think it kind of started maybe with the Six Sigma movement many years ago. And then we had all the belt programs uh, where at some point, and I come back also to principles where the certification became the goal. Thou shall have so many black belts. And there were formulas to calculate how many green belts you should have in the plant with so many people. And then people worked on improvement. And then sometimes I saw these improvement projects where I was thinking is the the purpose of doing this actually helping the people on the floor, helping the company, or just having a guy being uh, become certified. So uh, I think that's a, a huge problem. Now, as such, there's nothing wrong with education uh, and actually having a sort of check of, of knowledge. I must say, uh, disclaimer, I organized since 15 years the 24-day lead training program with certification in Belgium. And the Netherlands. So I think there's nothing wrong with education, but the question is what are we teaching first? Uh, and we talk about already principles versus tools. Uh, the, the question, however, is how, what is the value of the certificate? And sometimes I compare this with a driving license. Would you put a person in a car who just uh, passed the theory test on the traffic signs? We just take a class on traffic science, you read a book, then you do a multiple choice so that you know the red light and the green light, and then we're going to put someone in heavy traffic. That's not going to work out. So a lot of these certifications where there is no practical application or no coaching with people through real work is actually probably just a commercial initiative. So I think there must be some uh, also real life application before you can say something and then to continue with the driving license uh, analogy, okay, there's also a practical test, but does that then, and then you pass and you get your driving license, does that make you the expert? No, you've shown in some situation that you're, that you're able to handle some of the stuff that was happening on the road that day. But actually the whole learning actually starts afterwards because then you drive in the dark and then, there's, and then there's rain and then there's other stuff going on. And it's the same with this. You can educate people to a certain level, but at some point it will be the reality of doing things that will be the major part of the learning. 
And then the problems start again with, 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 with setting standards for certificates. Today, like I said, I'm not following HR certificates, but today I found out that in the Netherlands, there is now also a purple belt in legal. I was aware of the yellow one, the, the, the white one, and then the green and the black. And then apparently there's a purple one. So very interesting. And I was looking at that picture and then it says, for example, green belt is just understanding the basics. I think like, well, what does that mean? Understand that you have to have a black belt to be able to apply. So if I see, and, and with HR, I think it's kind of similar. In Lean, if you should count the number of certifications, you probably also end up with, uh, with hundreds. And you can do a black belt in six days, you can do it in 24 days, you can do it in three days with an online test. So the question is also a bit like, who is putting that value on that certificate? Is it HR people in companies that are asking this? You cannot apply for the job if you're not certified. Or, uh, yeah, I think there's, uh, again, there's nothing yeah. wrong with education. I think we do need education. The question is, however, what is behind the piece of paper? You know, Dirk, you make a very important point there about, you know, companies requiring, you know, a PSM, a CSM or some other XYZ SM uh, thing. Um, the problem is that most of those people requiring those certificates don't have any fundamental knowledge of what's behind those certificates or the processes or systems that are involved. And indeed, they should go and be educated and actually become part of that system before they start requiring them, I think. So I don't think it's all the, the, the individual's faults. Uh, Andrew, Steve, Sonia, any, any comments on this uh, hot topic? Andrew, you've just took the mute off. We're going to, we're going to Australia. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not as uh, cynical about this stuff, perhaps. Um, if I think about Agile, um, you've got literally millions of people who've been trained in Agile over the last uh, couple of decades. Now, as Jade said, um, a lot of that uh, hasn't been great. Um, and and the, the reason for that hasn't been great. And those people have gone into organizations and potentially done some damage. And I know that when I got my first certification in Agile back in about 2006 or 2007 or something like that, I probably didn't do great things with the teams that I was working with at that point. Um, but I think there's been a lot of really good stuff now uh, as well. And I'd, I'd hesitate to say that we're not in a much better place than we were at the turn of the century in terms of the way that we work, um, particularly in uh, product and, and technology development. Um, where I'm in at the moment uh, in this, I suppose the remote working space, that's like one, like the, the, this new frontier at the moment. There's all this intellectual capital being pushed at the problem. There's all this financial capital being pushed at the problem. So you've got this really interesting space where teachers are teaching kids to learn remotely. Uh, they're learning to teach remotely. Parents are helping their kids to learn remotely. They're working remotely. You've got all demographics tackling this new problem because they've been shoved into a space where they need to. Uh, and you've even got the elderly trying to learn to communicate with their families remotely from, uh, from, from uh, places where they're fairly isolated. So there's all this financial capital going into tools and solutions and stuff like that. There's all this intellectual capital pouring in. We, we, we're basically jumping from uh, jumping Moore's chasm by virtue of a sudden shift in energy in the system. Um, and we've, we've gone from early adopter to early mainstream. Um, from that, there'll be a bunch of stuff that comes up. I mean, we're going to be, we, we're, we're looking at uh, in, in the product that we've, we've developed. It's, it's more about how can we find experienced people and accredit them. Uh, but I, I do expect that there'll be things that jump up and I'm not scared of that. I, I don't think it's a, a bad thing. I just, I, I just think it's part of the system. No, I, I like that, actually. I, I'm, I'm more akin to accreditation than certification. I think there's something wrong with some of the naming conventions. A couple of comments coming in. My friend Carlos in Puerto Rico, uh, he talks about Rizzo Shingo. Shingo-san was the, the, the gentleman we know is the son of the great uh, Shigeo Shingo, who developed SMED and worked a lot with Ono on TPS. Uh, and he was once asked if he had a black belt um, in, you know, lean or smed or something of this nature. And he replied, the only black belt he had was from Kmart. 
and, and that's a true story. Um, and, um, you know, Dwight uh, comments that uh, all Scrum Master gigs require certification. I agree. It's a problem. I think we need to understand uh, what skills are required, which is what's been said. And Sonia, I'm going to come to you because somebody called Greg Spencer says, what would a black belt in embracing messiness or sitting in the messiness look like? I have no idea what that means. I'm hoping you do. Or if not, just give us your thoughts on what Andrew and the rest of the team have been saying. My husband will tell you I have a black belt in sitting in messiness, but I won't go there. Um, no, I, I think I would just, um, I think I, I two, two things came, came to mind based on the previous conversation. One is a slightly different analogy to the driving one, but you know, I think what the current, um, certification kind of focus drives is, is um, it, it seems to assume that things are context free. You know, many of the, um, many of the cert certifications that I've kind of had some visibility on trains people in recipes, not in principles. So it's almost like we're training recipe book users, not chefs. So when the context shifts, they're not able to, to actually respond to, to that. And then I think it also drives some perverse behavior because, um, you know, it, I'm, I'm reminded Dave talks about Strathern's um, variation on good arts law. When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And I would have thought that, you know, a certification or accreditation should be some kind of a measure of your ability or your skill but now it's become a target and now things have just become, you know, it's, it's gone pear shaped. Um, in terms of messiness, Nigel, I think the best that I can come up with is I think we need to actually embrace messiness. Um, I think there's a, there's a, a narrative that doesn't always get expressed where, you know, when people say, especially now in this post COVID reality where they're longing for the so-called normal, you know, what's the new normal, what's normal, you know, this, and I think we've, we've kind of internalized this idea that normal is some form of stability, um, you know, things being a little bit more neat and tidy, being able to control it, um, predictability. I think that's what people are longing to go back to. And I think what we need to understand is that uncertainty, messiness, that is normal. And we need to let go. We need to befriend uncertainty. I think I'll, the last thing I'll say is um, Diego Espinosa has a quote that he says, we've outsourced our relationship with uncertainty to certainty merchants. And I think mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to recultivate a relationship with uncertainty and embrace messiness as normal. That, that would be the best I can do. Some people are applauding you in the chat and, and I must say I could listen to you with some of these, these, these insights that you have. I could listen to this for hours. I mean, we, we're, we're almost out of time. We have about seven minutes left and I have one other question I want to pose, but un embracing uncertainness, uncertainty and messiness, isn't that the key sort of concept behind agility perhaps? I mean, maybe that's how we rebrand this agility, embracing uncertainty, uncertainty and messiness, if that's a real word, uncertainty and messiness. Um, Steve, any thoughts on this before we, we switch to our last final point for the session? Well, uh, well, there are many threads here. Um, I liked Jabe's um, framing with uh, with mental models. I think, uh, you know, in my thinking, mental models are absolutely uh, central. Uh, however, that's switching over to autopilot because you have learned something. I do not see it as related to uh, the certification uh, processes or industry as as such. It's uh, it's more that it becomes easy to fall into habit once you you believe that you that you uh, uh, know know something that you know stuff um the uh, the uh, um comparison with uh, with the driver's license i think is a is a good one i would take that a step further now i'm thinking of pilot license where you also have this idea that unless you're actually uh, uh logging a certain number of of hours well we won't trust you to uh, to take uh, to take command of the of the next passenger or passenger flight so there is this aspect of not only um, um, being assessed on the capabilities you have, but on the ongoing upkeeping of those uh, of those uh, skills. Um, and the the uh, in, you know 
I, I am probably the, the least qualified to speak about certification because like Dirk, I don't, I don't hold a single one. So I, I don't know what I'm talking about. But of course, I observe the industry. And I, I think we, we can say that there are three, uh, three problems. The first is, you know, what is the effective value of, of these certificates? Uh, if you sit two days and are qualified as a master, um, well, that, uh, that is easy to sell, but does it bring any, any value? How does the counterpart, those who are paying for these uh, certificates, really recognize that the value is, is there? Uh, so maybe one, uh, one thing is, as you're saying, you know, make a distinction between certification and accreditation. You have to sweat for it to, to show that you're worth, you're worth it. Um, so you need something that keeps, keeps people busy and, uh, and that they can show that they are really mastering uh, the, the, the topic. The second point is like the business model of the institutions, of the educational uh, bodies that, that uh, issue these, um, these uh, certificates. Um, there's a lot there that, uh, that is basically extracting rent and, uh, and brings no value at all. So I would say, you know, let's think of ways to disrupt this business model and, and come up with something that maybe is better. And the third point, um, it, it, someone hinted at AI before, I think in the comments, and you mentioned that, well, it's the, the uh, recruitment practices of HR departments. How is it easy is it to just go to your, your HR, Google, whatever engine you have, and, and uh, bring out all the, uh, the scrum masters? So it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy that unless you have uh, these, uh, these uh, three-letter acronyms uh, behind your name, you, uh, will, not, uh, you will not be short, uh, short, shortlisted. And that's, of course, is a huge motivational factor to um, to pursue these uh, these certificates. So I will conclude. Now it's it's time to disrupt this market entirely and uh, and uh, uh, you know, solve also the problems on the HR side. So, Nigel, you mentioned you know, those those that that um, ask for these certificates, they should know what they're asking for, which means that the HR department should become you know what? Certify. You know, we're, we're close on time, so I'm going to get, pose one little question for us all to sort of have the last few comments and wrap up. We may run over a couple of minutes, but I'm sure Hugo will give us the latitude of that. Uh, one of the comments in the, in the uh, flow here from Andrew again is, apart from a meaning to Sonia and some of her earlier comments, and I would uh, second that, he said certified scrum beginner doesn't really sell well. well yeah, I, I would not disagree with that. But uh, when we I found a lot of people rebranding their LinkedIn job titles as sort of, a, you know, resilience consultant, you know, suddenly there's a pandemic. Now there are, what, where, what? So, you know, there's a lot of that nonsense going off as, as well at the same time. But as we come to the sort of end of this, let me try and wrap this up a little bit and ask you all to, to contribute some final thoughts. Um, I've been working, of course, on the flow system. I know a couple of you mentioned that a little bit. My, my focus has really been <clears throat> to move away from more certification, more frameworks, and to bring together the different worlds that have been isolated for a while. So we've got complexity thinking, team science, we've got uh, distributed leadership, new leadership models. Of course, we've got lean thinking and agility, and we've got this concept of the flow of value and this continuous flow of value. So thinking about human factors, behavioral science, organizational design, leadership models, and of course, somebody mentioned in one of the questions, context being key, and I think Sonia hit on this at one point. What are some final thoughts you'd like to leave the audience with and those that watch the video later um, to help them sort of think about how they should move forward in this sort of lean and agile world? Final thoughts from you all. Let's start, I don't know, let's start with Sonia. I think thoughts on flow, Nigel, I, I've been, um... To, just to keep it short, I think something that I've started to realize is that in, in an organization, you know, an, an organization, I've started to see organizations in their entirety as flow systems. I think anything that matters in an organization essentially is a flow. And we need to broaden our, our thinking around that. So sometimes I think what happens is in our, 
in our search for efficiency and in our you know trying to optimize um, you know tangible flows flows of work flows of resources flows of value even sometimes we neglect the intangible flows you know flows of energy flows of authority you know all of these very human things so i think we need to broaden our our perspective on flow and i think maybe just from an organization design perspective i i think we really need to start thinking about how do we create fluid organizations with adaptive hierarchies and networks that can span the the boundaries i think that that would be my final comment wow who would like to pivot off of that so I, I mean, I think it, the one thing I would say is that, you know, a lot of lean, agile, um, the original Toyota production system, some significant tendrils of the history of that can be located uh, back to the Tavistock Institute and the concept of socio-technical systems. And one of the things I'd like to, you know, really make uh, people maybe engage with or think about is that, yes, we are, we're really bad at engaging with complexity. But we also are equally bad at taking the tools of complexity and just saying, ah, everything's complete, non, like everything is fluid. And, blah. and the, the point of socio-technical systems theory is to point out that there's technical systems that can be highly enumerated, used, numbers can be used on them. Uh, you can analyze them rigorously with math. And then there's a social system that doesn't respond to those types of things very well and it has a lot of uncertainty and flows of power and dynamics of knowledge and things like that and that you can't separate these two because uh, if you have a VCR leave it alone for a month or two and see if the clock is right. Humans make technology work right the technology doesn't work by itself so but that is not the same thing as saying we can't use rigorous analysis to do things like say if we build this bridge, can we drive a 10,000 pound truck across it? And it's the lack of that that, that is the, the source of failure for so many uh, agile applications. Just trust us, deploy faster, and the, and the architecture and the infrastructure will be resilient without having actually done any work to make sure that the architecture and, and um, operational abilities of the system are resilient. And the result of this is, you know, agile teams hitting walls uh, with their faces at high speed and they go, well, that doesn't, I don't like that game. You make me high wire walk, you promise there's a net and I fall 30 stories. I'm not doing that again. So it's a balance. It's a, it's a balance of the socio-technical system and it's an analysis of both and it's the appropriate application to both sides um, that, that gets us somewhere. And, and I, I honestly hope that we can have a better engagement with things like architecture, project management, and long-term capability building for systemic um, improvement. So that, that's what I would hope for. Fantastic final thoughts. Andrew, do you want to add something? Yeah, that was awesome though. Um, both, both it was answers. awesome, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, uh, probably what I'd say is that flow as a concept is unique to your concept context. You have a unique set of customers. You have a unique supply chain. You, you have unique strategic objectives. You've got a unique technology architecture. You've got unique people. The idea that you can lift and shift someone else's operating model into your organization and expect things to flow through like it does in another organization is a nonsense. Um, so I think, uh, people really need to think about how do I surface the design constraints for, mo for operating model design so that I can effectively design the flow of value through my organization rather than trying to find a pattern from elsewhere. No, I think that was fantastic thoughts and I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Steve Dirk, the last final thoughts, whoever jumps in first. Hello, am I muted? Or? Oh, okay. Yes, you good now. <laughs> um, so you know, flow is is uh, is a bit um, the the centerpiece of my of my work, and we mentioned several flows. I uh, I do work explicitly with uh, with operational flow, with financial flow, informational flow, and psychological flow, and we could add we could add many many more. 
Um, but I think there is one aspect that uh, that needs to be highlighted, that um, um, many of these uh, approaches, uh, with the uh, intent of making uh, more humane systems, they focus a lot on values and principles, like the Agile Manifesto. Uh, and uh, I think that that is the wrong approach. Uh, why? Because uh, values and principles are extremely important, yes, but they have to be developed organically by uh, each single um, organization, a bit like Andrew was saying, you know, flow is unique to context. Um, these things are so deep that uh, they, uh, they cannot be uh, copied over with a cookie cutter uh, approach. So how can you uh, get to something that is more humane than, uh, than uh, uh, what you ordinarily see out there? Well, my, uh, uh, my approach is to look a lot at patterns and mental models and uh, create moments of what I call enlightened self-interest. But that is really in the sense of, you know, what is deeply in it for me? Now, it might seem like a, a contradiction or we should, we should care about each other, we should care about sustainability. And here I come and claim that, that you should be egotistical. Well, yes, because what is needed is also the courage to express one own need. And that is missing in uh, most organizations. Yes, we're talking about psychological safety. It's, uh, it's like a, a blanket uh, term to, uh, to uh, create space uh, for this. But unless we get to the point where we are uh, comfortable in expressing our own needs, there is no way we will feel compelled to participate and all these lovely things that we are talking about of mental models, patterns, principles, value, manifestos, and you name it, uh, because you don't feel it's really your, uh, your stuff. So I think that is a first step to uh, allow for people to express their needs and to acknowledge those needs and then to find ways where these needs can be uh, fulfilled. Eventually, do this a sufficient number of time and in a broader context, that's where you develop what I call the unity of purpose and you get everyone on board and they will all pull. No, that's the wrong word. We can't pull. They will all flow in the same direction, Nigel. Steve, thank you. Dirk, you get the final comments before Hugo comes and wraps the conference or the little panel up. Yeah, actually, it's, uh, I can be pretty brief because uh, everything what my colleague panelists have been saying is, was spot on, I must say. Uh, Maybe my last thought about it is in the end, if you think like, why are we doing all this in all these organizations? Actually, there's a customer and we try to deliver value for the customer and whether it's a profit organization or a non-profit organization, we deliver value to a citizen, we deliver value to customers, which should happen actually frictionless in flow. And I do believe that the other perspectives on flow that for example, Sonia has been uh, talking about and that's actually also referred to, for example, what James said, I like the social technical systems approach as well. All these other types of flow are actually great enablers to, in the end, improve the flow of value to the customer. So they're definitely needed and they definitely have their place. Thank you so much, Dirk. And listen, guys, thank you to all of you. You have been absolutely phenomenal. I'm going to hand back to Hugo just to wrap up this panel, but I am so grateful. The fact that I know all of you, it's just awesome. I mean, the amount of knowledge that is in this panel, we could have carried on for another hour and I'll be quiet, Hugo. So we don't carry on for another hour. Hugo, back to Lisbon. Thank you so much, Nigel. Thank you all for this amazing time. Uh, we are really happy to have you all here uh, with us today and we'll start a new series of webinars by the end of November, perhaps starting with Nigel again. Uh, a big shout out like, to our co-organizer, Agile Alliance, as also our sponsors, Scrum Alliance, Mercedes, Benz, IO, Every, Scale Agile, CINT, IC Agile, MSG Life, and our main partners, Business Agility Institute, Lega Master, The Flow System, Central Med. So after the World Agility Forum 2020, uh, which will happen next uh, this weekend, we'll be back to this journey towards 2021. We'll, nice surprises to all of you. Stay tuned and have a nice day or evening, whatever you are. Remember, be safe, look for you, yours, and others. My name is Hugo, and I'll be back soon with all of you. Thank you all, and have a nice evening. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you.